So I just wanted to introduce this uh, conversation I had in this podcast uh, before you actually watch the episode um, and introduce the gentleman in the episode for those people who aren't aware. Um, this is an interview with my friend uh, Dr. Lawrence Blair who's a remarkable gentleman who, who is most well known for a documentary called The Ring of Fire although he has undertaken many other documentaries and uh, projects. He's a, he's a man who's lived here in Bali for nigh on 35 years. It's probably longer than that, uh, I'm sure, but a long time. Um, and in the, the Ring of Fire documentary, he uh, took part, he, him and his brother Lorn uh, went on a 10-year uh, expedition across the Ring of Fire region around Indonesia, ar around this part of the world, and documented their meetings with uh, tribes and different cultures um, at a time when obviously things were a little different from now. He wouldn't have been able to stay unlikely in a hotel like this um, down in the south of Bali, I'm sure. Um, he's a lovely gentleman, I, great individual, highly charismatic um, and intellectual, very respected in his field. Um, and although obviously mostly in the, in the field of sort of uh, exploration, anthropology and things like this, I would say that also he's very well known in the Qigong world, even though not a Qigong practitioner himself, mostly because he was the gentleman who filmed um, John Chang or, or Dynamo Jack, as, as, his ref as he referred to him in the Ring of Fire documentary. So John Chang is obviously well known in the Qigong world as the, the man who sets fire to newspapers and generates electric currents out of his, his hands. And this footage has been... Uh, spread around on the internet a great deal, but it was Lawrence and his brother Lorne uh, that first actually captured uh, this footage, captured this footage of, of John Chang uh, carrying out these feats. As I actually, I'll, I do repeat this in the conversation with Lawrence, but uh, Lawrence was, was very influential in my personal journey as well, because when the documentary came out, The Ring of Fire, the, the series, it was in uh, 1988, 1989, I think it was 1988, um, but, and I didn't see it then because I was eight years old. I was born in 1980. But a few years later, so maybe 92, 90, I was probably 11 or 12, I think, when I saw it. Um, and at that time, I was very fascinated by ideas such as uh, pirates and, and uh, exotic travel and ship journeys and exploring. And I used to be fascinated by Tarzan and Sinbad films and things like this as well. So this, all these kind of cultural elements coming together. So somebody recommended it to me and I watched it. Um, on an old VHS, but of course the part that captured me was the footage of John Chang or Dynamo Jack, it was referred to at the, in the documentary as he was. So although I was already studying uh, martial arts at the time, um, this kind of opened my eyes largely to what was potentially the, um, what could be attained through an art like Qigong or, or Nagong. And then it was kind of kept at the back burner for a few years until I started to meet people who could take me on this journey. So this is a, an interesting documentary, uh, an interesting, sorry, podcast episode, an interesting conversation for me to have uh, with Lawrence, uh, this man who unwittingly was a, a major influence upon my personal journey. Uh, so, yeah, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Between you. Well, thank you for having me over around your house. Pleasure. Yeah, it's nice to uh, it's nice to catch up with you again. Yeah, high time. One of the, the few the few other English people and that I know actually on this island, and I I, I still owe you great amounts of gratitude for during COVID providing me with what was a real lifeline, which was a roast dinner. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming round. I broke my hip, if you remember, and you yes. were sweet enough to come down. Give my parrot all sorts of presents. Uh, yes, well, it seemed a, it seemed a fair trade for Yorkshire puddings. <laughs> I, I, I'm really pleased here to come and, and chat with you. And um, I don't know if people know this. Uh, okay, if I just introduce a little bit, is is you are obviously most famous for your Ring of Fire uh, documentary, the 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 program that I think probably most people would associate with you, uh, which I won't ask you to recount for the. Thousands of time, I'm sure. Certainly, uh, one of my hats. One of your hats, yeah. But it's it's, it's definitely the, the first thing I encountered with you, and in, in, I saw it when I was a kid, um, and it in, it was a thing that really inspired me to head out into Asia in the first place, and certainly some of the footage, obviously, with a very famous Nagong practitioner, but also uh, the footage of different tribes and. Mm. 
their religions and their cultures and the mythology in there was really very influential in getting me interested in the Chinese arts. So I feel like I've come kind of full circle, really, because I've come from first seeing you as a kid uh, and then never expecting to meet you at all. It was not in my wildest dreams. And then a few <laughs> years ago during COVID, obviously, yeah. getting to know you and then getting to chat with you here in your house. So thank you ever so much. It's and now here honor. you are established in Bali, um, uh, your home now. A, filth, a filthy local. Yes. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well yeah. done. Good. Really. Based, based here in this island. So mm. thank you very much. <laughs> and and I, I really want to ask you about one, that one, a few things, but one particular question is very fascinating to me. And it very much is relevant to the arts I study. And it's that question around where mythology and culture, religion, and kind of cultivational arts, where they all come together, where they, where they meet one another. Because that's obviously, there's quite an entanglement there, I think, between these different areas. Mm. And I think your work has obviously been very much around this, this area. Even your doctorate was focused on yeah. this kind of idea, right? So I, I first of all really wanted to explore with you and get your take on it. From all of the cultures you met uh, and you encountered, of which probably more than most other people on this planet, maybe we could start with straight away with it. When you first encounter, what is your conclusions really on kind of, I don't know, how would you see how their view of religion and their view of life and culture really, how it comes together? Do you have any sort of conclusions around this? Yes, I suppose you could say that we in the West became separated from our environment and from paradise when we became intellectual sure. with the growth of our left brain, if you like, or the neocortex, when we began naming things and separating them from each other and from ourselves. Whereas the tribal peoples of the world, and I would consider the Balinese to have been until very recently a tribal people, a pre-technological people, they are still living at the, in the beginning of the world where there is no great distinction between the left and the right cranial hemispheres, where everything belongs together. And that was very much my uh, what attracted me to these people here, that there wasn't any great distinction between their religion and their everyday lives, and that you could go and spend all day in a temple during a festival day, and eat and drink and dance, and still feel connected to something broader than ourselves, something more eternal, something of which we were a part, rather than the dominator of. Sure. We're, we're very separated in the West, you know, we have cast ourselves from the Garden of Eden by eating of the apple of knowledge, which means that our hearts and our sensitivities, which are so alive amongst these tribal people still, have been suppressed to the basement. Right. Yeah. It, it, and I, I don't know how aware you are at the moment, but there's a, I would say that in the West, there's kind of a, a resurgence of a discussion around this, yes. this subject. I'm, I'm sure perhaps you've yes. seen it. Probably from discussions by people like uh, Richard Dawkins and Jordan Peterson and uh, some others. Yes. Uh, this kind of discussion of religion as a, as a reflection of psychology or religion as a reflection of something literal or... Mm. Uh, how would you see that? I, I mean, I personally see that one doesn't have to exist independently of the other, but... Yes. I mean, I wrote my doctoral degree on alternatives to orthodox religion. Okay. And it argued that in the West, religions have become just a habit, have just become the intoning of mantras that were once an actual technological language mm -hmm. for the invisible world. And it was as if we were just pulling levers in a great old abandoned powerhouse that were no longer connected to sure. any real wires or anything of any significance. Whereas here in the, in the East, that is not the case at all. They are still dealing with real things and for a whole number of reasons. Um, and that's why <coughs> I've always been much more interested in the religions of experience, experiential religion. And it does come, after all, from the original word, doesn't it? Really, Gary, to reconnect, to reconnect ourselves. And um, I argued the death of orthodox religion 
as a viable symbol system in our day and age. Right. And then shortly after that, I witnessed this great resurgence in religion's fundamentalism in the States. And I thought, oh, well, I got it wrong, didn't I? Sure. But now, uh, 50 years later, uh, I see that, especially in the UK, uh, far less people are going to church any more than they used to in Scotland. I mean, particularly, there's a, the Orthodox religion has lost a massive amount of following sure. for the very reason that I was arguing in my thesis for a start. And incidentally, one of my outside examiners at the time was a reverend gentleman, and they all have to agree for you to get your doctorate. And this chap s stuck and said no. And it was agreed finally that if you change the conclusion, which the whole of your thesis has been building up to as an argument, if you just sure. reverse the conclusion, we'll give you your doctorate. Otherwise, no. Hmm. And I thought about this for a while, and then I thought, okay. well, yes, I will. I will prostitute myself. I'll make this argument, and then I'll say, well, actually, this is what I mean which is what I did. And then I wrote the book, Rhythms of Vision, which was the unedited version of what I'd actually seen. And it's surprising how 50, that's my problem. I'm ahead of my time. It's always been very inconvenient for me, both economically and in other respects as well, professionally. Sure. That, that it does seem to be now the case. Everybody is reverting to uh, religious methods of meaning, in healing, right. in food, in general consciousness, in dream awareness. The, the 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 real meat and potatoes of what it is to be a human being. Sure. Okay. Yes. And one thing that I think is very different here, my um, encounter certainly with Balinese spirituality, as as well as for want of a better term, is that uh, the idea that it's something that is cultivated as well, like it's a kind of practice, your connection to the religion, rather than in the West, it feels like you either decide you're mm. religious or you don't decide you're like it's a decision, you know. Mm. And once you've decided you're religious, that's it. Mm. Whereas there's a whole, um, I guess what you're calling the experience of religion, there's a whole practice, a mm. ritualistic aspect mm. to it that is that's very beautiful. Mm. It's very beautiful. And, oh, please. Well, I was just thinking, for instance, mm. they have this system of equally distributing water that comes down from the sacred lakes of the highlands to right. one side of the island, and then when they've had enough to the other. So it's a very egalitarian as to how you distribute water. And... Every year, at the beginning of the year, uh, based on lunar and solar indices, so it's really yes. connected to real time rather than arbitrary clock time, all your ritual events will flow from the decision as to when you direct water through a temple system to another whole community. So the distribution of water is linked to the timing of the actual seasons, right. which in okay. turn is linked to all the basic... Uh, events that you have in the year the fun stuff sure do you do you feel there's a what what from a purely maybe a little basic question from a practical sense sort of practical approach to spirituality what do you feel is the benefit for these cultures to staying within these rhythms that we've lost maybe within the west well, it's infinite because it's all part of, you know, when we became, when we ate of the apple of knowledge sure. in the West and decided that not only were we, that we weren't even animals, you know, yeah. we were beyond animals and that we could control nature. Yeah. Uh, we lost the plot, didn't we? We're only now really discovering with this global warming thing that we are very much a part of nature and it is a lot bigger than we are. And if you learn that before having screwed up the whole planet, it's quite useful. Sure. Um, I, I don't want to make it sound as if it, these, the, the Asians and tribal peoples are necessarily sort of uh, angels, because in many ways they're not. I mean, they're terrible with plastic and stuff like that, as you know. Yes. And they've taken to money avarice as well, with great gusto. Mm. Uh, because it could be argued that, 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 that they're more childlike in this respect. Uh, I don't mean that in any disrespect for them. It is in the positive sense that children are more open mm. and more naked in their emotions as well, but also more connected to the realities of life. Sure. in many ways. And to be more connected to nature itself is surely what we need to do to live a long time and sure, have a sure. healthy life and for it to be fun and full of love.
I think that's something there as well that is is my experience of religion or spirituality in the West is there's like a hierarchy. <laughs> so you have the world, the natural world, and then you have God or religion, then there's you know there's like a gradation in between, and one is seen as lesser. But it doesn't feel like there's any separation That's right. here between them. The sort of uh, mm. this idea of the divine existing within mm. the natural world, or, or or ideas like this, that I think, even though I know that logically, I still have, I can still feel in my brain a little sort of struggle with that concept when mm. I encounter the the religions here. So it's like a religious practice that actually by my definition as a Westerner, it isn't really a religious practice, mm. if you get what I mean. Mm. Uh, and also, there is a great deal of just habit here. Mm. It is as if they're enacting to the memory of mm -hmm. a time when they really did know. You see, the fun thing about, at least here, what's behind Balinese religion in particular, is animism, which sure. is the belief that everything is alive with its own particular energies, and some things more powerfully so than others. The confluence of rivers, specific trees, mm. specific rocks, they have some energy to them that is significant in the overall chess game of energies that's going on around us. Sure. And this was, of course, considered to be just superstition until quantum mechanics arose. And we realized that, indeed, everything does have its own particular signature mm -hmm. soon, and some things are much more uh, powerful, both destructively and creatively, mm -hmm. than others. So, uh, in, in a way, one has to remember that, that, that it's not as if they know all this much, still only a small percentage of them know the truth of what's going on. Sure. Um, but even then, as a, a whole, the culture is cradled by the mythology of knowing a truth sure. that they are no longer perhaps aware of, that was known very much by their ancestors. Yeah. I mean, they used to live a lot longer, it seems, than they do now. You know, we filmed is this, that the Balinese specifically? The Balinese did, really? too. Okay. And we filmed this fellow who was uh, Nyoman Lempad of okay. Bali, yes. who you might remember, who's yeah, also yeah. in the films, and he mm. died a conscious death at 116. Some people say, how do you know? How do they know when they were born? Sure. Well, in Bali they do, because they know when the volcanoes went off. He so everybody's got a good old. idea of when, <laughs> how old the guy is. Sure. And he says that he didn't live as long as his parents or grandparents. Mm. Okay. And one asked him, well, why? How did you live that much longer? And he says he doesn't really know, but they lived a very... Uh, well, he says religious life, but of course that rings all sorts of bells in the Western mind. Sure. But what we understand by religion in Bali is you were connected to the earth. You were a farmer and an artist mm -hmm. and a philosopher. All those three things belong together, as they used to in our medieval systems. And certainly they do in tribal pre-medieval systems. Mm. It feels like uh, one of the ingredients here as well, and certainly very relevant, to what I do and probably the, the people that are going to watch this is energy, that word that you're using uh, a lot, which is often divorced from religion in the West a little bit. In fact, it's a little heretical, isn't it, sometimes to even yes. speak of such things. You get tied to something and set fire to. That's right. But the, the kind of, I guess, subtle energy is the word is the, the kind of key to a lot of the practice here, even habitual ritual practice or, or something like this, right? So I wonder if there's a, a kind of weight to the kind of energy and environment, even if you have 10,000 people doing a ritualistic habitual practice, they don't know what the function of it is. Does it, do you think it still generates yes. an energy? I definitely do. And especially mm. if you're into this fellow Rupert Sheldrake, you know, who talks about morphogenetic resonance fields and everything. Uh, thought has power. And uh, one always thought, well, how useless of a nun to just spend their entire lives there sure. all by themselves praying away in some monastery. Well, mm. in fact, it turns out that it isn't. If thought has energy, it adds to the weight of mm -hmm. something beneath the surface of this material world we're on about. Sure. Well, you can't deny the power in the Vatican. There you, there go. you go. It's got a resonance. There you it? go. Whether you like it or not, it's a separate thing, yes. but there's definitely a, a, a power there. Yes. It, it's And the cultivation of this uh, energy, which as f from the people that teach me, their view is basically the more this energy is cultivated, it kind of yokes you to the potential for divinity or, or yes. connection to something higher, right? Definitely. Um, and the, the various mechanisms and things that people have used to cultivate that energy is what I'm very interested in. And especially, because I've already told you as well, I've always had a fascination by the, the, the stranger cultures that you met. So one I really wanted to ask you about, 
and it's probably the one that I thought when I saw all the different cultures you talked about, I thought the most off the wall one were the ones that believe they were from the Pleiadian system. Yes. I have to ask you about those if that's okay. Yes, yes, yes. Would you mind explaining that culture for people? Well, who aren't those are the Taraja people in sure. the highlands of central Sulawesi Island, who were only discovered around 1910. Uh, the local people, okay. it's very recent, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the other tribes referred to them as the people from above. And um, they were known to the other tribes as being psychic and strong uh, in that area. And they believed their ancestors came from the stars in skyships, specifically from the Pleiades. Now, they're not the only people. The Dogon of Africa also believe mm. that. And when the Pleiades are sighted, remember, it is also a time when you plant. There is, it is an indices for the time. It links you to the agricultural rhythms of your environment. Okay. But yeah. it's... It may be more than that, because, you know, when you're talking about the directed thought... Uh, if we can't see it, we okay, if we're sailing a sailing boat, you just see a horizon. But if you're following your compass, you will see something occasionally. Then you'll see birds and sure. you'll get indications you're going in the right direction. Uh, the, 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 the directed thought attracts the reality around it that uh, you're directed towards. And, and, and one feels that very strongly in the Taraja tribe of, of people there, for instance, they bury their dead in hollowed out vaults high in cliff faces yes, yeah. and they line the balconies outside them with effigies of the dead people uh, who they say attract the ghost of the dead person to stay in there and they change their clothes, they're carved in the likeness of the dead person, they wear the clothes of the dead person for the first few generations and it's almost as if it anchors a part because they believe we are onion skins of spirit. Okay. And that the innermost spirit actually returns to the origins, which they refer to mythologically as the stars from which they came. Yes. And in itself, yeah. it is rather a lovely metaphor, as there are in Bali, about these onion skins of the human psyche and the human soul. Um, what the Tibetan Book of the Dead definitely talked about very specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, that we have completely lost sight of in our Western world, and that there is still a memory of here. And okay. I think they still live it in certain very unmodernized areas of sure. the planet. Do you, do you have an opinion on the uh, literal nature of their story? Because obviously they build their buildings in the shape of what I would consider yes. UFOs and things like yes. this, right? Which is also a very interesting thing. And same as the, the Dogon tribe, I, don't they have jewelry in the shape of... Like, they do. And they have this interesting thing, which is they, they yeah. use their, their, the actual shape of their roofs yes. are like the bottom half of a circle. Right. And okay. they say that is a symbol of us in this material world only see a tiny portion mm -hmm. of the great cycle that we're part of. Mm. And most of it is invisible. And that we slide down into the world and we stay briefly and then we go on up again out sure. of sight, out of mind, but it doesn't mean that it isn't there, this great sure. circle. And that's something that is of resonant significance also in quantum physics and quantum mechanics and the higher areas of contemporary science. Sure. That, of course, we know we're living in a world of illusion, which the Asians have always told us that this is a world of minor, Maya of no significance. Mm -hmm. And we don't really believe in the West or haven't. The only real thing for us is this. Mm. But now we're rather confused because we now know that this is an illusion. Absolutely, it isn't. Yeah. Uh, it's full of emptiness. Yes. Once you start exploring, it's just a headache. That's so it. It's just a headache. <laughs> I, 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 this, is a, this is always the... This was the thing when I first came to Asia to encounter that was I'd grown up from a background to believe that these kind of metaphorical symbols they used, like the half circle or whatever, was a way for ancient primitive cultures to understand something they didn't understand, hmm. which is obviously highly insulting mm. and derogatory. But I guess that was the underpinning mm. message I was taught when I was growing up. Sure. And then when I came here to realize that actually they were ways, in my opinion, ways for showing you, showing your way in, your brain in a way that was easier to understand yes. deeper truths that actually are far more literal than, than yes. you might believe at first. And so many of the instructions, if you want, almost literal instructions for how to build this energy to connect to the divine were contained 
within all of those mm. kind of symbols. It was a real bending of the brain to right. sort of make that switch. And it was only when I started to do that, I think I developed any kind of understanding how to make their arts work. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess I'm trying to pin you down a little bit. <laughs> I mm. apologize for. No, go for it. Uh, do you? How do you view these symbols? Do you? Do you? go by that view that they were based on ancient mythology to explain things that were not understood or do you believe they were actually um powers in themselves yes and instructions sort of literal instructions and something deeper or do you have another view no i don't think they're literal instructions i think you have to mm. learn the language they are a language of symbols okay yeah. and if you're speaking a different language they can be nonsense mm -hmm. And uh, the great mistake we make all over the world, here included, I might add, is mistaking the symbol for the actual thing. Mistaking sure. the finger pointing at the moon, sure. for the moon itself. Okay. I mean, over here, I remember we had a place, well, particularly there was a branch of this place called Bali Buddha in Jakarta. And the Muslims in Jakarta, well, actually, no, the Buddhists in Jakarta made a terrible fuss that this was... Uh, not the way to refer to Buddha. But of right. course, if you think about it in the early days, the early Buddhists, they would carry a symbol of Buddha made out of wood. And then they, had, they gave this, this story, didn't they? There's a little bit of story of a Buddhist monk. He got really cold up in the mountains. And so he took out his wooden copy of the Buddha and he chopped it up and he made a fire out of it. <laughs> Local villagers came up and said, how could you? You, a monk of Buddha, how could you do that? And he said, well, I was trying to find the real Buddha in it. I was trying to find the essence of Buddha in it. Sure. I can't imagine a Christian or a Muslim maybe doing the same exactly. with their holy artifacts. That's right, or... because we tend to take the symbol as the thing itself. Sure. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So did, uh, out of all of these uh, cultures and these tribes, um, if it's okay to explore with you a little bit, um, you were talking earlier about different groups that are also able to manifest this energy. In, yes. in some layer as well. And uh, of particular interest was the, the uh, I apologize, I've forgotten the name for the tribe, the one that you went to meet that was very remote, that touched you on the... Head. These were the Punan Dayaks in Borneo, right. yes. Excuse my ignorance, mm. I apologize. No, Would no. you be happy to explain those to us? Well, the, the, you know, the people who are familiar with Dynamo Jack or John yeah. Baharudin, who's a last leftist, uh, who's had uh, a presence on the internet for a very long audience. period of time yeah. and has attracted millions and millions of hits, uh, who, who said he has these powers whereby, having practiced this form of Qigong for a long time, he can actually d d d disseminate qi from his hands and in different, well, well, different parts of his body, but particularly he uses his hands, which has different effects in different ways. He can ignite things, he can draw things to him, he can push things away. I've seen this, I've felt this, I've felt this, and he essentially used this just as a healing technique. And uh, he, he isn't the only person I have encountered who has this particular energy. And I was telling you at lunch, one of the people who completely blew me away was the shaman of a very remote tribe who we were lucky enough actually turned up to the tribe because most of the time he's out wandering alone in the forest himself. He's a great master of all the natural products of the forest. And he comes back every so often to his nomadic tribe, which is not so easy to find if it's wandering all over the place, and to heal them. And he doesn't just, just heal their bodies, he heals their psychological problems, he deals with their dreams. But he is a person who laid his hand on my head, and I felt the same energy that I'd felt from Dynamo Jack, mm. or just a charge, uh, not hippy-dippy energy going through me, but sure. like you've stuck your finger in the power socket. Well, yes, and then well, the other time I, I felt this was when I was at a posh dinner party in Sydney, funnily yeah. enough, many years later, and there was a Chinese guy there who had come over to live in Sydney. He'd come over with the Prime Minister, who's the one who spoke, I can't remember his name at the moment, who speaks uh, Chinese and was a great Sinophile, and he'd come to live in Australia. And I'd been talking about Dynamo Jack, and he invited me next door to his particular apartment where he also touched my hand the way Dynamo Jack is like this. He says, are you ready? Yes. Oh, and he gives me this shock. So it's interesting to know that there is, the, there are the vestiges mm. of techniques which were common in Asia and are still common in their mythological stories mm. uh, amongst 
the few cognoscenti who put enough time and effort into being able to manipulate these energies, which they all say we all have. You know, and Dynamo Jack says we all have this ability, but it's uh, like we could all play the violin, but for quite a lot of it, it's not worth it. It's not worth studying eight hours a day. It would sure. still sound like a cat on the roof, you I know. I torture my partner with a violin <laughs> lesson. Yeah. Yes. But for some people, uh, they have a, ta a talent for it, mm. and it is a real thing. And it's in all of the artwork I've seen around the world as well. You can once you've experienced or seen it, you can see that there's symbols for it. There's yes. lightning bolts and yes. fire around people That's right. and, and things like this. So it's now, really been commonplace at some. Despite stage. what I told you just now, mm. there is a common language in that sort of symbolism. Mm. I mean, I've always been very interested in sacred geometry because I was a mathematical dunce, and I part of my doctoral thesis was writing about Pythagoras, and he talks about these Pythagorean things. So I had to build them out of matchsticks. Completely blew my mind. Three-dimensional right. geometry. How? What is the language by which order? exteriorizes itself into the three-dimensional world, this world of illusion. Sure. It has its own laws, its yes. own grammar. And that is, uh, from that, are fairly universal symbols in terms of mandalas and triangles mm. and centering devices, uh, shapes that have a particular effect on our, on our psychology mm -hmm. because they are related to the grammar through which we see and perceive. Okay, yes. And these, uh, the building of the, these kind of side of it, the energy that, that people are building, was the view for the people you met that it had some function beyond uh, just a trick or something? Like, was it, was it directed towards some kind of spiritual growth, or I know some direct towards medicine? Or Because that's what I find oh, fascinating. Oh, the, the, these powers, these cities, you mean? Yes, because the, the energetic work is only interesting to me if it, Yes. takes you somewhere, do you know what I mean? Yes. If there's some kind of benefit for the individual. Well, I've never gone far enough with it, but Dynamo mm. Jack told me, perhaps mm. you have already, he told me, you can begin in the earlier days with this, where you can use this to your own ends uh, very negatively. Right. Uh, but yeah. the higher you climb in it, the more you realize that it is a broader connection to things. You realize that you're damaging yourself if you do sure. it in the wrong yes. way. So it has a sort of an inbuilt ethics or morality to it that you encounter irresistibly, like the current of a river. Sure, okay. What do you think that is? What do you think it encounters in you? Is it your own nature or is it your karma or is it something unknown? Or I think it is the world we live in. I think it is okay. the psychic world, the river that we're swimming in, the okay. currents that bind us. Rather as physically we're living in a world of Darwinian laws. Right. Inwardly we're living in a world with other laws associated uh, with That's it. interesting. You don't see them as a clash between each other, those two? Not necessarily at all. Because obviously that's, that's a key argument for people, isn't it? Yes. Like the evolutionary Darwinian view or the mystical yes. view, if you want. Yes. You don't see them as a, a, as a Contradictory forces. No, there's a temptation in the Darwinian world, of course, mm. to be Darwinian and everything for yourself, and you are the winner and you're the powerful and strong one. But mm -hmm. if you go into the broader picture, which is what going inwards takes you to be, you see the broader picture. And as we now know, you know, it isn't just a Darwinian world of uh, red and tooth and claw. Uh, male Yang, as sure. Darwin was himself. Yes. There's just as much female energy in the real world, collaboration, yin, accommodation, uh, adjustment, those are malleative forces. Um, uh, I tend to be rather optimistic. I don't see the great hidden world of beyond us as a cold place. Sure of Darwinism. I have a feeling, I know from my own experience, that there's extraordinary light and order in it. I hesitate to use the word compassion because it's too Christian for me. Sure, okay. But that there is a sort of, and also I say this from watching the natural kingdom, we talk about it being, you know, the strongest winds and everything is eating everything else. Yes. It is so untrue. There's a magic going on in the natural kingdom that we're now becoming aware of. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, for sure. E even if you just go and spend time in nature, the amount of 
connection and compassion you see between Definitely. animals is not and how connected it all is yeah. in a way we had no idea of you know well the the fungus enables the trees to communicate yes. for example and things like this i mean that's that yes. rocked my world yeah i have to say yes yeah so we and that it is a brain as you know this is the incredible yeah. thing the mycelium that links the mm. roots of trees is a medium it is the brain that can uh, it develops a, a genetic memory the trees rise up and die as individuals and crash to the ground again. But they have built up memory in this mycelial network, which is the thing that lasts virtually forever, ever until it is uh, wiped out by fire or some other poison sure. or something like that. So it doesn't have their brain in their leaves, but in the communal whole lot of them beneath the soil entangling their roots. Yes. It, 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 yeah. I, when I started reading about that, I... It seems strange to me that people can be so, um, I guess, materialist and reductionist in their view, and then hear something like that and accept it, not realizing just how absolutely amazing that is, the, the, the sheer exactly. mind-blowing nature of, of the things we don't know. And That's you right. would have thought fungus under the ground and mm. tree roots would be something we understood quite mm. well by now, but I guess not. No, yeah. we don't know shit, as they tell us. <laughs> so what, what, were you... Did you have a Christian upbringing? Is this, yes. This was your background, was it? Well, yes, and I have people in the family who are bishops and all sorts of people. Oh, really? Awful. I yes. didn't know that. Oh, yes, okay. churchmen. They were either, you either killed for God or you proselytized for right. him. They were okay. soldiers or churchmen. So, so your journeys are almost a little rebellious, a rebellion in some level? Yeah, well, yes, because I mean, I went to a prep school, a little concentration camp in Gloucestershire, sure. where you... Uh, prayed twice a day, you know, okay. and I thought it was such a bore. <laughs> yes. And then on Sundays you did a whole thing, and it was such a bore. You didn't like the singing? I didn't like the singing, it wasn't really okay. my thing. No, I, I was <laughs> before rock and roll hit sure. the UK, really. Yes. Uh, but it didn't do it for me. So how did you feel when you encountered all of the, the culture here when you first came out to Asia? Was there a, a discomfort with it, or did you immediately... <sighs> Blend well, no, because that? I was in, my parents emigrated to Mexico from the UK. Oh, I was lucky so. enough mm. for that. And uh, it was there that we became involved in a meditational technique. We all, also had all sorts of fascinating people coming through the house at the time. Timothy Leary, who was like right. the king of acid at the time. <laughs> Ad Adamski, George Adamski, the person who wrote the first book on flying saucers. Right, okay. Uh, cool. UAPS, as they're now coyly called. Yep. Um, and US so my, my parents were searchers. Aerial phenomena. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anomalous phenomena, I think they call it, it, yes. Right, okay. Unidentified anomalous phenomena. But uh, so there was already, I have to hand it to my mum, she was a searcher, she wouldn't put up, and she was also brought up kind of Catholic, really. Right, okay. Although she was sent to a Catholic school, uh, which she also loathed. So it's quite a big leap to move to Mexico and do meditation. Yes. Okay. And that meditational origin was here in Indonesia. And so my first, uh, yes, I, we were involved in a meditational technique whose guru was here in Indonesia. Right, okay. And so I came over here as a delegate to a conference to Java. Oh, and I, I found that. these people were extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, that this was nothing like the religion I had experienced in any way like the religion I'd experienced as a school kid or in churches in England. Here were people who could go into an altered state and tell whether somebody was going to arrive on an aeroplane or not. You didn't have telephones at the time. You couldn't tell if they were coming. It was a three-hour drive to get to the airport, even right. though you might have received a telegram saying, we're coming on, on such and such. I say, you should have left by then. And uh, we've, They're not coming. They're not on this plane. Right. Oh, okay. And that had a high kind of degree rock. of accuracy, was it? High degree of accuracy. Right, okay. That's impressive. And a stuff. high degree of joy and of bliss, right, okay. which I had not experienced. <laughs> you were used to the, the guilt and shame. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's right. Okay. right. Yeah. And so it was partly based on that, well, actually very much based on that, and my own experiences too with this mm. meditational technique and how it had began illuminating my dreams in a strange way. Mm. Um, and how it, for instance, ignited uh, uh, a family thing that is, uh, we had certain dreams when people were going to die in the family, a certain right, okay. sort of dream, which I began recognizing and had on three vivid occasions. I knew that was going to happen, and it did happen. 
so that was what uh, encouraged me to write a doctoral degree back in the UK in Lancaster University yes. on experiential religion. How were those ideas received, if I can ask? Then, uh, a while ago. Not very well. Fortunately, I had yeah. one wonderful professor, my own professor, who had been professor of religion in at Oxford, and yes. he'd been sent up to start this new department of religion at Lancaster, which was a new red brick university. But of course, uh, when push came to shove, as I told you at the beginning here, you know, they almost didn't give me my doctorate because sure. I dared suggest that Christianity was losing ground. <laughs> okay, sure, yeah. But uh, with my, I had a great time there because I could go all over the all over the UK, exploring witchcraft and Pythagorean groups and different groups uh, healing with color and okay. things like that. And uh, it opened me up to a whole world I didn't even know existed there and corroborated what I'd got the taste for in Indonesia. Okay, sure. And having done yeah. that, I came back here to find plenty of it still going on here. Right, okay. And so, so when you were out here and you, you started um, traveling around, how did meeting all those tribes and different cultures, what did that do for your connection to spirituality or, or did it open you up at all? Well, the, the, the particular meditational technique yes. that I'd acquired, yes. was, uh, to put it, this, this, it's in the book, you know, Ring, yeah. Ring of Fire, I, I think I mentioned it in various other things, but it's very, very simple and straightforward. It's a meditational technique that fills you with an energy that you can allow to penetrate you or you can stop. Right. And okay. uh, while it's going on, you're in a fairly blissful state. Okay, yeah. And because one had learnt that, we found ourselves on numerous occasions with very remote tribal peoples where we were linguistically mutually unintelligible. We couldn't understand right. each other's language. Yeah. It didn't matter if you could go into this state because they could do it too, and part of their religion was to do that, as it has been here in Bali. They're trained from an early age. That is what they're after. That is religion for sure. them. I want to go into that state where you see and feel and know things differently than you do with your mind. And it put us on the same track. And that's one of the key qualities you've mentioned there. I always think of like uh, authentic connection to that place where this kind of energy arises yes. within you is, is the bliss or the yes. happiness that, uh, that yes. arises. But yet when I come here to Bali, I encounter the opposite is they have that, they have this blissful energy, but then they also have a very strong belief, oh, I'm gonna get the word wrong, like sadat, sadat, or maybe you could correct me on that, the sort of uh, black or dark version of the, the energy that they view as being a part of the, the world, right? So I, I, when I first came to Bali, I was taken to watch the um, local priest clearing the, the black energy, the negative energy out of the, the locals, and they were going into fits and writhing on the floor. Which exorcism is a form of exorcism. Yes, completely. I think they called it sadat or sadat. Uh, do you know that word? Or maybe it was their term. They, adat, maybe. Term. Adat is, uh, is, well, adat is really a uh, tradition, but, but, right. but maybe not. I'm not a linguist, so sure. you're probably right. Mm. But uh, to the out, to initially when I first saw it, I, I could imagine it would look a, a quite freaky to a lot of people because oh, yes. it looks a bit like an epileptic mm. seizure or, mm. or something like this to watch them... Um, clearing out, but I'd never sort of palpably seen that kind of idea of negative black energy being mm. such uh, a cultural thing for them. Uh, have you had any experiences with that kind well, of Well, absolutely, and you see, the, the tourist industry seized ecstatically upon this little statement, Bali, island of the gods. Sure. But it's inaccurate, it's equally a, an island of the demons. Sure. They're into balancing these two. And you see, in Christianity, in Judeo-Christian tradition, doesn't have any of that. You stay away from the devil. You only look at the light side. Sure. So we're imbalanced. We're not in balance. And, uh, of course, it exists in medieval Christianity. You would have your exorcisms, and mm -hmm. you would give expression to this. And the thing is, here they teach children to go into the state of trance, or have done traditionally. Well, to do go into it. Absolutely, I from an know. early age. Oh, okay. Right. In fact, because all the arts, dancing and music were really gifts to the gods, you would be in a state of trance, mm. openness, to be able to do that. You were vehicles, you were channeling these things. So that meant that you had to learn fairly early on what you were channeling. 
and to be able to come out of it if it was the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, certainly you have to walk the path of darkness in order mm. to be able to walk the darth path of light. That has always existed in the Western inner tradition as well. Okay, sure. You have to, to be a warrior of consciousness, you have to embrace both sides. That's a very pragmatic approach. I never thought of that. If they were going to go into trances, they had to learn when they were in the wrong yeah. state, yeah. Uh, the wrong place. Yeah, I guess that's two sides of the coin. If you drop into that place, yeah. you're not always in charge of that, right? No. Okay. I mean, I don't understand how people can't see that the, the black magic is a part of it because you only have to look at the artwork. I mean, it's not as if all the statues in the temples are, are these angels. sort of altruistic looking angels. Not at all. No. And, and they, of course the other thing, they have a lot of demons in their architecture and their sculpture yeah. and their things because they use demons to frighten. This is at the lower sort of popular level mm. of mythology because they reckon that one of the best ways to f frighten a demon is using another demon. It's got to be a friendly one. Right, okay. Yep. You fight fire with fire. Or gongs, gong banging. They there have a bit of go. gong banging, don't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, watching the uh, dance as well, the, the girls doing the beautiful dance with the giant fingernails. Yes. And these are all, uh, I presume, I don't know much about it, but expressions of this idea of the sort of light and the dark interplay. Yes. Yeah. It's And you see, the, you've got this lovely dance of the girls, the first, you know, the story of the first human, uh, the Balinese story of the first human, which is danced by young girls as well in a state of trance. The, 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 their story is that in the early days there weren't humans in Bali, there were gods, a few of these sort of forest gods. Mm -hmm. And one of them uh, came across a pool in the jungle, which is where the seven sisters of the Pleiades, the seven celestial sisters, That's would come down again. and bathe okay. naked in the waters of the world. And they would fly down wearing their sarongs as wings. And this guy spied on them, and of course he fell in love with one of them, and he stole her sarong so she couldn't fly back to the stars with her sisters. Okay. And he said he would only allow her her sarong back if she bore him a child that he could remember her by, remember her eyes, in, his, in whose eyes he could remember her by. Oh. And that, as she, sure enough, came to pass. His, her child, their child, supposed to be the first human being who was the result of star children and Earth things. Right, okay. It's that, that same mythological idea once again, yes. right? The, the coming together of yes. the two. So it, it can't help but in this, maybe this is where my brain is limited. You know, like when I talk to you and I talk to other people here, the separate, the sort of mythology and the energy and the religion, to me, I, I'm still always curious about what is the literal truth of this? You know, like part of my brain still wants to cling to the what is the actual reality of fact here? But I'm also coming to the conclusion I'll probably never figure that out. Well, well, no, no. I, I think I think there are actual rea factual realities behind okay. this. I think definitely there is. What are your conclusions? Share with me. Well, you have to be specific in what area. You know, like uh, hmm. I mean, uh, when there are. Uh, in uh, village disruptions, when things are going wrong in the village, jealousies, violence, anger going on in the village, they hold an exorcism, particularly with the Ketchak monkey fire dance, sure. where as many as 60 of them get together, and all 60 of them open themselves up as channels yeah, of these energies. They don't have a story and a mythology about it, but that's secondary to the actual business, the actual technological aspect of having 60 people of the village open mm -hmm. to expressing and reconciling these energies as they oh. are before they've manifested in individuals as anger and rage and da da da, -da. Okay. And with the most amazing results. It is a very successful psychophysiological mm -hmm. technique okay. for exorcising disharmony. So it, and are they effective? Does it they are very right, effective. Okay. Yeah. You know, they've been doing it for a thousand years. I think they wouldn't have been doing it if it hadn't been so effective. They've it's like, you know, a doctor, you don't go years. to them anymore if he's not working. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it, the, uh, it, the, trans, the trans thing is uh, an interesting concept to me because coming from a, 
I guess you could say a little bit of an orthodox meditation yes. tradition myself. Actually, trance is sometimes advised against. Yes. In in and that's another separation within Asian. Yes. Uh, sort of sort of culture, but here it's embraced. But also, they have a meditation tradition. They as do. Well. They, they have don't... both. Exactly. They do. They do. Yes. They don't separate mm. them at all. The Manku seem to be engaged in both. Uh, the the priests may mm. seem to be engaged in both of these things, mm. right? Have you have you tried any of their practices? Have you given it a go? Or well, I mean, I, 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 the thing that brought me here, Subud, that I told you about this meditational mm. technique. It is underlying, in a way, all religions. It mm. is naked religion, uh, naked of any theology yet. Okay. Uh, and, and my belief is, you know, as soon as a guru of a religion dies, uh, forget it. Look at Christianity. <laughs> I, I, I've I've always agreed. I always think that once the the holder of a tradition is gone, yes, it's kind of limited. Maybe yes. they had some students who were able to. But that's where the theology more. then creeps in and rules, right. and the mm. essence, the water of it, the mm. fire of it, is no longer there in the same way. Okay. Um, so and, and yes, I, I've been attracted by. It's hard to become a fundamentalist. Animist, sure. Uh, it's more a poetry of the way one sees and feels the environment, and I mean, I love the way they dress certain trees up in certain ways, and yeah. they have uh, certain shrines in those trees that rise as the tree rises as well. Mm. There's a, a great. I love the way they make offerings to different points of the day, different times of the day, and the recognition. But different times of the day have a completely different feeling, a different resonance, different possibilities, different impossibilities in them, mm. which we never consider in our clock-based time. Too busy. <laughs> Too busy, exactly. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, uh, and 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 uh, all of it places you in touch with with the rhythms of the environment to which we are subordinate, mm. wonderfully subordinate, and the great, I suppose dark shadow about our global warming, not just global warming, global poisoning, is that we are, it sounds so trite when you put it into two words, like abusing, I mean, the whole thing that nurtures us. We're abusing ourselves in the most extraordinary way. And this is why I don't think we're going to be able to save the planet by telling us how naughty we are to poison everything. I think we can only do it by igniting our sense of wonder, love, and amazement mm. for what is going on. And you know there's more and more fuel for that love and wonder and amazement from the new sciences, mm -hmm. from the new um, things like, I mean, my, my particular interests now are things like a, Emerge or consciousness in nature, emergent behavior is when you get all sorts of creatures of the same species gathered together and they begin behaving like more than the sum of their parts. Right, okay. Like you get yes. this much matter together and something behind matter can at last express itself. Mm -hmm. and, and like the mycelium consciousness that we were talking about just now, that's another area of it. And how quantum mechanics that seem so abstract, where you have um, twinned particles where if one of them changes its spin or its vibration, its twin will do the same infinitely distant from it, yeah. anywhere in the universe, instantaneously. And that those are revealing themselves, that area of knowledge is revealing itself as crucial to how we think, how we communicate, how birds navigate, mm -hmm. how even such stuff as uh, photosynthesis works mm. all over the planet. There's a whole new dimension that we are just on the brink of, that we won't know about, our children's children will begin to feel more of, like a whole new life. Think how long it took for us to really, for it to sink in, the realization that the Earth wasn't the center of our universe, that the sure. sun was. But some people uh, haven't even quite agreed on that yet, have they? But no, no, yeah. <laughs> flat Earth is absolutely... Still working on it. Yeah. Even though it still looks the same, you still see the sun rising as if it's the sun going up. But because we know it's not what's happening, yes. a whole new area has been opened up in us that increases our consciousness quantum fold. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening now in the new worlds of science, 
matched by the new worlds of meditation, mm -hmm. experiential, real experience of what's going on inside us. I always wonder if part of the difficulty with that is is that in order to study a lot of those things, uh, sort of cutting edge science and, and quantum theory and things, so that obviously involves the intellect to a very high degree, engages outside of your brain, which by its very nature is quite a separatist, isolationist thing, isn't it? Like the more you engage your intellect, the more you're separated yes. from others. So there's a real um, sort of challenge there, isn't there? How there do is. you study something that is really connecting with a part of your brain that's really separating? And well, I don't think you do. I think we each have our own areas of expertise. You right. see, okay. the, the scientists are doing that, but the meditators, such as yourself, ought to be able to feel what it all means. And from my point of view, I'm interested, they're all specialists. They don't know what the next scientist is doing next to them. They are oblivious to the broader picture, by and large, mm -hmm. because they are scientific intellectuals. But there are those who begin to see how their little area fits mm -hmm. in with the broader picture of other people's area of expertise. But throughout the sciences now, completely different specialties are revealing the same extraordinary new horizon mm. of the absolute opposite to materialism. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, direct knowledge for yourself through experience and in, in yes. uh, a kind of knowing that arises from, from mm. what you're doing. This is where I, I see a little bit of a risk of, at the moment, where they're trying to, there's a movement to try to turn all of these things we've discussed, Eastern culture, Abrahamic religion even, all of these things to turn it purely into a form of psychology. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like they're using it, these are all just models mm. for the way the brain thinks and these are all models for neurological patterns mm. and I, I see a little risk at that, Yeah, a risk of that because it's... It's similar to studying mm. the neurophysiology of the brain expecting to find consciousness there. Yeah, sure. If it's a radio, you know, how are you going to find the radio station from taking a radio apart? <laughs> It's yes. a, 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 a misfocus. I yes. would agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Then maybe that's uh, maybe that's the biggest strength for these kind of cultures mm. is that they didn't have that separatism. True. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we should leave it there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been really nice chatting with you, and thanks for sharing your ideas. And like I say, very special for me because, like I say, you were. Uh, more influential than maybe you would realize in the early stages of setting me on this uh, path that I followed. So uh, I feel very grateful to be It's great. I, it's sweet of you to say that. I get that a lot, but I'm fully aware of the fact it isn't me at all. You know, I'm only cha channeling my own sure. life, and it seems to have touched people in a lot of strange ways. Though it felt like a very lonely, it still does in many respects, a rather lonely road to hoe. Sure. But uh, it's such a relief to hear that it's, you know, it's whatever it is one's resonating to at certain times in one's life is something beyond all of us. And that's what we all respond to. Yeah, well, you, your work has reached a lot of people. Uh, I know that. Right. But before we finish, is there anything you want to let people know about projects you have going at the moment? I'll link to things like the Ring of Fire. Under okay, the Ring of Fire, the book as well is yes. coming out again. And then I'm involved now in a thing. Uh, I, I've made a little film which it looks as if I'm going to be doing a whole series on now, which is uh, about these things, consciousness in nature, I've just been talking to you okay. about a bit, which is called Behind the Scene, S-E-E-N. Okay. It's about being, you know, here we are preoccupied with, well, here we are cooking the planet. It seems ironic that just as we're cooking the planet, we're just beginning to understand what it is. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, you know, you talked, you began by talking about flying saucers or you... U apps, as they're now called. I prefer UFOs, but well, I do called. too. Yeah, and and yes. and yet, you know, Jung says they're a projection of our unconscious, this, that, and sure. the other. But now here we are seeing them shot from the cockpits of military aircraft and everything. Sure. But in a way, I'm not sure. I mean, the point is that this particular field that I'm interested in at the moment is just as extraordinary, mm. uh, and it's much closer to home, and just as mind-chattering as if that... But if I was picked up by an alien craft and taken to a distant planet and interrogated about my planet and my species, who am I? Sure. I'd have great difficulty in not sounding like a dumb earthling. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> It'd be an adventure as well. Well, Maybe it is. Well, I mean, my, my point is we don't really know 
yeah, yeah. anything quite yet. Mm -hmm. We're so early in history, thank goodness. Sure. If we can survive long enough to find out. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. If we get past the next extinction event or whatever. That's yeah. right. Well, thank you very much.